So I'd like to um, ask Dr. Hind Hussain to, uh, to start her first case presentation. Thank you, Dr. Hind. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to present the first case, uh, which is about a 73 years old gentleman uh, with a biprosthetic aortic valve, which was done uh, for aortic valve stenosis um, due to congenital bicuspid aortic valve. And uh, he had also a dacron graft uh, to the proximal aorta. That was in 2012. He has a, a mild left ventricular uh, systolic impairment. And that was uh, by the echo scan, which was done two years prior to his admission. At that time, the valve was uh, well functioning uh, with no issue related to um, uh, his valve and his uh, aortic, uh, ascending aortic graft. And he was uh, actually on three yearly uh, follow up with the CT uh, aortic root and uh, um, the proximal ascending aorta. And uh, the latest uh, scan was done uh, about um, two years uh, prior to his admission, and it showed uh, some mild calcification in the um, uh, CERC and uh, RCA, so there was no significant coronary artery, artery disease. So um, he was uh, admitted, sorry, so he was admitted with a two weeks history of uh, shortness of breath and uh, symptoms of orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal uh, dyspnea with increasing leg swelling and reduced exercise tolerance. Uh, he also had uh, four or five days of uh, fever with sweats and uh, cough productive of sputum. Uh, other background, just to mention, other significant background for this patient uh, is hypertension and high body mass index and uh, some uh, arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, he was on uh, amlodipine uh, for his hypertension on admission with an aspirin and he was on 40 milligram of frusamide and he was uh, on hydroxychloroquine for his arthritis and some uh, ibuprofen like PRN and uh, some salbutamol inhaler. Um, he uh, lives with his wife, uh, he walks around using a stick, uh, so he's his um, relatively independent and uh, he's a non-smoker, drinks uh, a little bit of alcohol. On uh, clinical assessment uh, on admission, he was apyrexial, uh, his heart rate was, he was tachycardic, heart rate was 150 beats per minute, he was hemodynamically stable, uh, blood pressure was within normal, uh, maintained saturation 94% on room air. Um, Examination of the heart uh, revealed no audible murmurs with a normal heart sound. Uh, he showed some signs of uh, uh, failure. He was actually in failure uh, with a raised JVP, um, bibasal crackles with slightly reduced uh, breath, breath sounds uh, bibasally. He had a moderate uh, leg edema up to thighs and his weight was 123.5 kg per admission. So part of the workup was the ECG. So if you can, um, can you go back one uh, one step, uh, Hind, you can just go back one step. Yes. Go back one slide. Okay, so I'm just going to stop you there and just ask uh, for some input here regarding the clinical presentation. Um, perhaps uh, one of the panel members can comment on whether what they what their thoughts are at this stage before we go on to look at the ECG. Can I can I come in there, please? Yes, of course. Right. So thank you very much. Uh, that's that. It's a it's a very very interesting conundrum. I think we it kind of represents what we see on a regular basis in clinical working. And I think uh, uh, I'm I'm grateful that you've highlighted it because it actually shows up the dilemma that we are facing with with these conditions. Um, I refer to some of the stuff that I've already spoken about, which is around the pre-existing illnesses and the, and the warning signs of where we're going. So this gentleman is, and I deliberately didn't speak about BMI uh, earlier on, but BMI is also one of the factors recognized. So elderly male, elevated BMI, pre-existing cardiovascular con condition, including heart failure, 
Um, and perhaps in, in the whole of that, he probably, what he's missing is um, not, uh, not being a diabetic, but who knows, he might be a maturity onset, diet controlled, uh, hypoglycemic as well. And the, the fact that he has developed uh, this illness uh, and what the giveaway is obviously the fever and the cough would suggest, which is over and above his baseline um, sort of uh, cardiac function, is suggesting that there is an additional agent here that is, that is active and that in the current climate is probably COVID um, or any other viral illness that might have decompensated him. The heart rate of 150 is suspicious and I would be very keen to look at. Now, obviously we've all seen the ECG, but my, my point collectively was that, you know, I would be suspecting that something else has happened. You know, people in this situation don't go to 150 and remain stable without decompensating. So usually it's atrial fibrillation or a severe sepsis that's causing this. So high risk person with high comorbidity and likely to have a poorer outcome if, if uh, he doesn't respond to early treatment. Thank you very much, Professor. And just one, can, can um, somebody comment, perhaps Dr. Mohammed Badri, on where would you assess this patient in terms of, is this patient someone you would suspect to have COVID? Would you assess them in, in a COVID uh, section of the, of the hospital or a non-COVID section? I mean, initially, uh, this patient has a background of uh, cardiac disease. So he should be assessed in a COVID, uh, 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 a COVID world at least because this is very suspicious of having shortness of breath or subnia, although the background could be have gotten tachycardia with 100, a heart rate of 150 new onset arrhythmias or an endocarditis. But it's still, I need mean, suspicion of having a COVID there and we should be very careful when screening these patients. Thank you very much. So that would mean you, you wear appropriate personal protective equipment when you assess these patients. Be mindful of where, where you're assessing them in the A&E department. Um, so Dr. Hind, could you please yes, carry on with the presentation? Oh, should be very careful about doing when we are doing the echo for them. Yeah, thank you. So, um, if you'd like to show the ECG, and perhaps we can ask um, one of the other panel members, perhaps Dr. Yaqub, to comment on the ECG. Yeah. So, uh, to start with, this is 73 again, Tilman with background history of AVR. Uh, and, uh, now presented this acute decompensating heart failure with tachycardia and fever, although uh, temperature is normal in the examination. So obviously, uh, coming to the ECG, the ECG is clearly identified atrial fibrillation. There is some uh, lependal branch block, which is uh, not uncommon in this type of patient as his age and uh, background history of cardiac uh, surgery. So uh, the ECG is clearly showing uh, atrial fibrillation, labandil branch block, and some uh, 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 PPCs as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lisa. So please, can you carry on, uh, Dr. Hind? Uh, uh, no, old ECG, actually, just to compare. As we can see, that was he was a normal uh, sinus rhythm, though it's, it's really quite old uh, ECG. It was just to show um, maybe just some T inversion. Um, in the uh, lateral lead, but there's nothing exciting actually. Maybe just in... this is x ray. Um, as we can see, anyone would like to comment on it or uh, shall I just carry on, Dr. Ahmad? Uh, does, does anybody want to comment on the chest x ray? There's a, a got a cardiomegaly, the heart is very enlarged. Got a pulmonary condition, which suggests pulmonary edema, but it's still on this background, you still cannot exclude. A COVID, but uh, it looked like a very congested lungs with a very big heart. So this is a picture of heart failure to start with. Uh, can I just also come, jump in, please, if you don't mind, um, Ahmed? Um, yeah, of course. Um, so sl slight, slight sort of difference of opinion would be it's a it's a rotated AP X-ray. Um, the mediastinal shift towards the left clearly suggests that you know the position of the patient is is is, is awkward. And also, because this individual is 123 kilos, the exposure is critical because um, there will be a lot of soft tissue to, for the x-rays to get through. So I would have commented on saying this is a rotated x-ray, poorly positioned, underexposed. Um, but having said that, those are the caveats. There is clearly evidence of bilateral infiltration. Um, I'm not sure I would comment on the heart size at just at this stage, but 
clearly knowing what we know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the heart is enlarged. So very, very suspicious x-ray. The right costophrenic angle is not visible as clearly as I would like it to be. But if you look at the soft tissue shadowing over there, there is clearly um, the, the, the mammary tissue is enlarged and superimposed. And you, what you don't understand is whether there's uh, fluid in that base or whether it's just soft tissue overly, overlying it. So very markedly unusual and abnormal x-ray, but I would stop there. Okay, uh, Dr. Hendrik, so, would like yeah, to carry on? Okay. Right, so yes, as um, uh, actually mentioned, this is obviously an abnormal chest x-ray and it shows diffuse um, pulmonary congestion, in both lungs. The costophrenic angle is not very clear, but it might be there is very small amount of diffusion. Um, uh, but, you know, the uh, uh, remarkable finding is the uh, congestion in both lung fields. Blood tests uh, were a remarkable actually for a raised uh, uh, white cell count and neutrophil count and uh, a low uh, lymphocyte count. CRP was not particularly high actually and his kidney function showed uh, uh, stage 3 chronic kidney disease with a creatinine of 115. Calcium, magnesium and thyroid function tests were normal and uh, lactate was normal, ALT was slightly high, uh, probably um, secondary to congestion. So at this stage, the initial diagnosis for this patient was new uh, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate and decompensated congestive heart failure and lower respiratory tract infection. He was actually initially was uh, treated as high suspicious for uh, COVID, uh, but his uh, COVID screen was negative. Okay, so if we could just go back, uh, go back one one slide. So, does anyone have any comments on on that? Does does anybody agree or disagree with that? So, Doctor Said would like to. So, I ask this question to myself when I'm looking after COVID patients. And the question I ask is, what is the pretest probability of them having COVID? And that is the reason I ask myself that question is to get away from what we call COVID blinkered diagnoses. If you look at where we are now to where we were four weeks ago. Majority of patients were COVID test positive. Where we are in the UK with the flattening of the curve, majority are now 90% negative. So you've got to remember your pre-test probability. This case, the clinical finding, one important thing, the cough with COVID is usually dry and non-productive. This cough is productive and green sputum. So you may have one overlying infection, lower respiratory, I get, and maybe a decomposite heart failure. You may have COVID, but the pretest probability, you've got to put the time scale on that. Are we talking about the case right now in which country, this country, then the pretest probability is low, and I would predict it would be a low risk case. If you asked me five weeks ago, I would have said he was intermediate or high. So you've got to ask the question at the right time because this is the issue currently of the rapid assessment units and other places that if you just have two symptoms, shortness of breath and fever, then you'll be looking after COVID for the next three, four years. Uh, Said, can I also make a comment around the test itself? Um, I think one of the things that we, I don't know, I'm sure people are aware of this, the sensitivity and the specificity of a COVID test in the current day and age varies quite uh, significantly depending on what you're using. And the rush test that we, that we use has probably about between a 65 to 70 percent sensitivity. So just be aware of, 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 and this is just for general audience consumption, is that you know a negative test may not be negative. And uh, also in terms of the exposure, there is nothing that suggests that this person's um, exposure to COVID, wherever that might happen, um, is he a day one exposure? Is he a day three exposure? Is he a day six exposure? And the probability, again, the retrospective data that's coming out of, of the registries is suggesting that if you test too early, you might have a negative test, which will then becomes positive. And the probability of positivity increases with, with, with days, right the way up to day six and day seven. So just, just be conscious of that, that we are dealing with um, an illness that is very new to us. And the impact of that uh, on our normal ways of thinking is, um, is, is going to be variable. 
So I am looking at it from a slightly different angle. I mean, as I say, just looking at it from the point of, you know, what other possibility might explain the symptoms. I'm looking at it. I know what the other possibilities are, but could this person have COVID? I think the background tells us that he's at high risk of it. Yeah, thank um, you, I, uh, Dr. Yes. Nasreen. Yes, please. I think even having the lymphopenia, we raise the suspicion. Yes, you cannot tell. But being a high-risk patient, it's better to take the possibility of having COVID earlier on so the, the prognosis will be worsened if we delay yeah. uh, putting this possibility. So I will uh, be very considerate about this lymphopenia and will take it uh, as a part of COVID. Thank you very much. So I think, I think most people would say that they would test for, the, for this type of patient uh, with this type of presentation. I think most people would say they would... Um, test for it at up front. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Does anybody disagree with that? I, I, I would say test and then retest. Okay, great. And in terms of precautions, you know, where would you where would you manage this patient? In a side room, in an open ward? What would I, ideally in a side room and then with monitoring and do the basic treatments that we do and watch for the response. If he responds and the retest in 24 or 48 hours is negative, then we are on, the, on, on a winning track. If however he is continuing to deteriorate despite the treatment, then suspicion is high that he's hiding something. Great, thanks very much. Uh, in some centers, oh sorry, Dr. Said, yes please. Yeah, so this is the risk now. Uh, your pretest probability is intermediate or low. I wouldn't cohort him with other patients waiting for results because yeah. the risk he then has is negative. Either he becomes positive because he's got true positive and we just first test was wrong, or he then becomes inoculated with other patients who are truly positive while waiting in the same area. So I agree with Shay, he should be isolated, a repeat test done, because his pretest problem for me is low, but he should be in a side room on his own, treated as COVID with all the uh, PPE that you need and retest maybe four or five days down the line. And then if that's still a negative, then he's a true negative. He can then come on to a normal ward but I wouldn't put him with other people who are waiting for results or who are already positive. I wouldn't do that. Okay, thanks very much. Can, can I ask about the, the role of uh, an early CT test here that could, could, could help us in identifying whether the patient will be in a separate room or, or, or just in the ward? A CT test. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, and, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think we're doing this at the moment, uh, certainly not in our, in our centre. We don't do routine CTs, um, but, but certainly that is one uh, possibility. But the other issue is that some of the changes you see on the, on the CT may be similar to the changes that you'll see in heart failure. Um, so, it, but, it, but yes, that's, that certainly is a consideration. I, I, can, I, can I come in, please? Yes, of course. Right, sorry, uh, I, I think... The, the, the helpful sort of intervention in this individual is isolation and aggressive treatment of heart failure and AF up front. Uh, that probably, and the response to that is probably a better discriminator than a C, because if you've got heart failure or COVID, there are, as you suggest, um, overlapping um, sort of uh, features on the CT. So I don't think the CT will discriminate as easily as we would like it to. Um, it's a radiation exposure, which perhaps is not that relevant in, in this context, but it still is an unnecessary radiation exposure. And it doesn't actually, uh, I'm not aware of any data that helps you look at that CT and say, I'm gonna change my management in, in any other way. So I think you'll still be mon sorting out the hypoxia, the heart rate and the blood pressure and the fluid output. You know, those are the things that you would, you would want to, ideally isolation, I think Said's point is relevant that this should not be um, in, in mixed with other patients, et cetera, et cetera. However, in the circumstances that we practice medicine in this country, uh, we have over the years done away with separate room hospitals. We, a majority of our wards are now shared wards. Um, and uh, that was for economy of scale rather than any clinical sensibility. Um, and we are now regretting having moved from having single rooms to large shared boards. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Hin, could you uh, continue with your presentation? Thank you. Okay. So uh, indeed, this patient was actually isolated in a, um, a separate room. 
because he was um, uh, highly uh, suspected for COVID. Uh, even after his uh, COVID uh, screen was negative, he was still uh, in a separate room. Uh, so uh, if we come to the management for this patient, so the aspects of management, uh, as uh, Professor Janeja mentioned, the treatment of uh, his heart failure, uh, his uh, atrial fibrillation or heart rate control, and uh, of course, uh, treating his uh, acute infection and uh, the uh, assessment for uh, long-term anticoagulation. So he was put on telemetry, started initially on uh, bisoprolol, or we will come uh, later to the how uh, he was managed from that point of view. Uh, he was started on the heart failure treatment, um, uh, IV frusamide initially 80 milligram twice a day. He was also started on uh, oral potassium as his uh, potassium was in the lower limit of normal and he uh, was started also in IV frusamide that will lower his potassium further. Uh, was put in fluid restriction to 1.5 liter per day, uh, daily weight and daily uh, renal function and intake output chart, and the plan was to repeat uh, transplastic echo once uh, his uh, heart rate is, is controlled, uh, just to reassess his uh, heart function and cardiac status. Uh, for his uh, respiratory tract infection, initially was started on uh, IV tazosine for a couple of days, and then he was switched to uh, oral coloxiclav. His um, CHADVAS qualifies him to uh, be started on uh, DOAC, and he was uh, actually started on Apexpan, uh, five milligram twice a day. Okay, if you just go back, just go back one, it's off the hint. Okay, so uh, anyone have any, any comments about that management plan, initial management plan for that patient? Yep, Dr. Said? Is it only like you, the hypo, she, she's hypokalemic or he's hypokalemic, so the standard case short-term measure it's like he was already on a diuretic before when he came in. He's going to continue on a long-term diuretic. So I'd be looking at amylaride instead of Sandoke as a long-term, because he's going to be on diuretics long-term. You're going to only give the Sandoke maybe three days, and then you're going to leave them off and send them home and then find out they're still hypokalemic thereafter. So that's the only thing I would think of doing. And then the Pixaban, I would obviously look at the... Uh, Cracking clearance, you have to calculate that rather than the EGFR to work out the dose to give them because he's got a CKD stage three already. Okay, and Prof. Shahid, Junejo? Uh, I, I would thank you very much. I think a very valid point. Uh, Said the other option might be things like aplerinone or uh, spironone lactone, which we have potassium sparing as well in the longer term from the heart failure point of view. There is more prognostic um, gain from doing that. It, it, other rather than for amylaride, but anyway, you know, either or. I think I would have been a lot more aggressive in um, the rate, sorry, AF management, i.e. Um, um, IV metoprolol or amiodone upfront if, the, if there is a hemodynamic stability to allow to do that, because the quicker we get him back into sinus rhythm, the, the less or the shorter his illness is going to be, and uh, and the earlier we are able to get him out of hospital rather than put him into um, over exposure type uh, or sort of situation. And I wouldn't even hesitate considering DC cardioversion up front if I've got facility to do a TOE to make sure that he hasn't had AF for long enough to cause him to be having a intraatrial thrombus. So um, for now, that those those would be my comments, and to try and get him out of hospital as quickly as I can. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any comments? Uh, Dr. Dr. Abu Surud? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, actually, I, I just I want to make a point here. Um, I, I mean, in, t in terms of, um, of, of uh, potassium sparing diuretics, I, I, I would rather wait till we do the echo, and if his ejection fraction is lower than 35, then he's eligible for a prognostic benefit from starting a plerinone or aldosterone, any aldosterone antagonist. Um, and, and this will help with his potassium level as well. Um, in, in terms of, of atrial fibrillation, actually, I would rather prefer to unload the left ventricle and try to bring down the um, filling pressures uh, by, by diuretics. Then I can 
uh, reassess the, the, the atrial fibrillation later on. That, because when filling, when filling pressures improve and uh, when we unload the left ventricle, that might help with, um, uh, uh, with, with the rate control of atrial fibrillation. And I, I think at, at, some st at some point of time, if we do the echo and the left atrial size is, is very big, then at that, at that point of time, we might think of long-term rate control rather than rhythm control, which might be unsuccessful or it, it might not be maintained if, if we revert to sinus rhythm. Okay. I've got a yeah. comment about that. Uh, yes, Dr. Peter, before the echocardiogram or knowing the fluid balance. I think that I will wait for that. That will be maybe plan B. Till, till I saw what is the uh, echo findings, what is urine output, and what is fluid charge showing. Okay, that's great. Do Professor Janejo? Yeah. Can, can I come back on those two points, please? Uh, we, uh, absolutely, and I, I, I agree. I think if you turn the clock back by about six or seven weeks, when we did not have, or sorry, even about months, when we did not have COVID to fight with, and we were looking at um, managing heart failure, acute decompensation in elderly people, and so on and so forth, um, I, I absolutely agree that that would have been my uh, position as well. I think in the last two or three months, what we've learned is that the quicker we can turn these patients around and get them out from, an, from a risk environment, if they are stable going out, they tend to stay out and behave you know, less at risk than, than they would otherwise. Uh, I mean, Said alluded to earlier on, and, and my experience also is that we have high comorbid patients coming into a hospital for acute um, uh, exacerbations of their already established chronic illness, um, then they stay in hospital for a longer period of time, acquiring other things that they didn't have when they came in, and then the outcome becomes becomes bad. Now, in, from a COVID perspective, the background of this individual is a high-risk background. This individual is not going to do very well if he picks up COVID or already has COVID. So the quicker we can stabilize and get him out, the better it will be. The point I omitted earlier on to men mention, I think we probably are alluding to that indirectly, in is an echo is critical because the other thing that you want to find out is this patient has had a tissue aortic valve in place. We need to understand what the gradient of that valve is. Is there degenerative valve disease? Has he now got critical aortic stenosis that's causing a problem and his LV dysfunction? And that should also influence what other treatments we give him. If there is significant aortic stenosis, then high dose diuretics or other medications are likely going to be detrimental. So early echo, early rhythm control, early intervention is probably the best way for this individual. Dr. Yakub. Yeah. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for nice case. So uh, uh, this just tells us how uh, COVID era changed our understanding and our practice in uh, when dealing with heart failure. And this again, it tells uh, how central a heart failure is in the COVID era. So mm -hmm. this patient is typically AVR, was stable, moving around, uh, despite his uh, being set 73 years. Uh, there was no mention about any risk of contact because just uh, his wife is taking care of him. And uh, he presented with a uh, very clear uh, kill decompensing half area on background of AVR. So uh, after we offload, then we need to ask ourselves one central question. What is the main drive of taking this patient to the hospital? I mean, what is the main cause of his decompensation? We can see that he's, ha he's having uh, atrial fibrillation, which is new, with rapid ventricular response. COVID being negative or positive, I don't think it's going to impact anything on his management. It's just important for epidemiological viewpoint and uh, protecting his path. But for his, the case management, it's not going to change much. So I would prefer, after just uh, putting some IV prosomide, then I will look to tackle the atrial fibrillation. 150 heart uh, beat per minute score is fast in someone who is already have uh, AVR and EF was 40 two years ago. So I would go for uh, risk control because this is new once the atrial fibrillation. And then depending on echo, we see where to go elsewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've got quite a lot of, uh, you know, you can see this is a real case and there's variation in practice. And, you know, there's, there's some that are saying we need to tackle the rhythm, get the rhythm sin to sinus, 
let's no let's tackle the heart failure uh, so i think it's, it's, there's there's very there's lots of ways you can tackle this uh, particular case um timing of echo his heart rate is 150 um, perhaps dr abu Sirud, maybe we can can uh, can comment on uh, on the yeah. timing of echo in this sort of case yeah yeah yes Ahmed. actually I, I i think at the moment if we, we have to ask ourselves first before doing the echo what are we looking at if you are looking at a system of um, LV systolic function then i think this is not the right time to be looking at it because with, with such high heart rate and and uh, the r to r variability that might be very uh, difficult to to precisely uh, assess the ejection fraction I would say if, 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 if uh, the patient is not hemodynamically unstable and things, I would, I would rather wait for some time uh, till we unload the left ventricle and, and get some fluid off, uh, then assess the ejection fraction when the heart rate goes down a bit. So I guess what you're trying to say is that the assessment of the valve will be affected by the fluid status of the patient and perhaps wait until their heart rate is better controlled and they're yeah. offloaded. Would everyone yeah, exactly. agree with that as a strategy? Yeah, exactly. The preload affects the, the assessment of the heart function, yeah. Okay, so um, Dr. Hind, could you continue your, your presentation? Okay, so, um, so this patient had a contrasted echocardiogram, which was a targeted scan uh, in the uh, view of the uh, COVID. As we so, know, as you can see that there is no... Uh, We'll just ask Dr. Um, I'm just going to ask Dr. Abu Saroud, as uh, an echo specialist, if yeah. he can comment on this. Yeah, uh, I just want to say uh, that this echo was not done immediately. It was done after the heart rate was controlled, uh, maybe in about four days, uh, you know, following the start of the um, uh, heart. Uh, I mean, the heart rate uh, uh, medication like bisoprolol, and he also was on uh, digoxin. So, and um, I'll just uh, leave the. For you to okay. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Dr. Hen. So, so looking at this uh, apical four chamber view, I, I understand that it, it probably was hard or technically difficult uh, study because of the uh, BMI of the patient. Uh, so many segments of the, left feet, of the left ventricle can't be seen well, but I can I, I can say that RV is, is not dilated. The left ventricle, um, it's it looks for me like severe impairment of LV systolic function. I, 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 I can't see the lateral wall clearly here, but I can say from the apex and septum that uh, it looks global rather than regional variability. M maybe the basal, basal septum is, is, is moving a little better than the rest of the ventricle, but I would say this is clearly a severe impairment. Okay. Uh, anybody uh, disagree with that? Yeah. Okay. So if you can carry on to the next slide. Uh, okay. So yes, just I want to mention that as um, uh, you know, we can see that uh, unfortunately the, it was a really poor uh, echo window, and this is just secondary to the body habitus of this patient. Uh, but obviously, we can see the obvious. Uh, the RV appears to be contracting, but it might be dilated. If we go to the next slide, so um, as you can so see here, yeah, shall I read that? So we're going to ask, yeah, Dr. Sarud, we've got some more views here. Well, uh, from here, the, in, in the three chamber view, um, I, I think there is some foreshortening of the apex. Um, so it's, it's, it's but, but again, the, the infralateral wall looks to be severely hypokinetic or akinetic. The septum as well, at least till the mid septum is, is severely hypokinetic. Um, the color on the OVOT, I think it's not, it's not clearly open, not fully open, but uh, it doesn't show uh, significant regurgitation, and I can see a little bit of mitral regurgitation coming in the view here. Thank you very much. If you'd like to move on, Dr. Ansay. Okay, so uh, they were very quite, uh, limited views, actually. The whole study was about 10, maybe to 12 
um, uh, images and I've chosen the best of them actually. But I would just comment on this, if we can see here, the aortic valve, it, it looks um, very thickened here and uh, doesn't often really, well, it could be due to the poor function. Uh, this is only single view for the uh, uh, short axis of the aorta. Uh, the only view that was done uh, uh, with this study uh, is not really visualized, you can see. Um, Yeah, I, 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 I can't see the leaflets here very well. Um, yeah, but I think small, I think small opening well. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I think maybe some Doppler data can can help to give the suspicion of, of um, you know, malfunction of the, of the valve. Right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Uh, it's not really clearly uh, visualized. It's only this is the only view that I got from the you know the scan of this patient. Uh, we can see the Doppler here it might be more than two. Um, again, uh, there was no measurement uh, as it was really quite a limited study, and uh, the recommendation is not to do any measurement during the scan anyway. Okay. So that was the report of the cardiac physiologist. Uh, so uh, this scan was reported as severely impaired. With global hypercalemia, uh, normal RV size with impaired RV systolic function, and uh, mild LA dilatation. The bioprosthetic uh, aortic valve uh, uh, reported a slightly thickened, with a velocity of 2.8 uh, meter per second and a maximum gradient of 44, with an average of, four, uh, of 33 and a mean gradient of 24. And this is compared to the previous study done uh, um, abnormal for uh, in the, there was an increase in the uh, uh, Doppler uh, gradient and velocity. There was no paravalvular and uh, transvalvular leak, mild MR and trivial uh, TR. So, uh, so these are the measurements uh, which was done by the uh, cardiac physiologist who done this scan. You can just go to the next slide, please. That's a hint. So, um, thank you very much. So, I think you know we included this case really to, sh to to highlight that actually getting an echocardiogram in the COVID area can be very challenging because there is you know patients are, uh, and scanners are at risk of uh, echocardiographers are at risk uh, when they when they are scanning patients um, and the the British Society of Echocardiography give some recommendations for how to perform a transthoracic echo during the COVID uh, era. Um, and the, I, I've just mentioned them here. I'm not going to go through every single one, but, but certainly one of, one of the uh, issues is that you should avoid ECG, use time loops, and do a focused uh, scan, and to try to minimize the amount of time that you're spending with patients. Um, and then do, take all your pictures and do perform the measurements uh, offline. Now, you can see that actually the quality of the of the of the echoes during this period may not be as good as as they as they were prior to covid if if the echocardiographers are following this particular advice does anyone have any comments about that and whether they've seen that in their own clinical practice uh, can we comment on the echo itself or yes yeah, yes yeah uh, yes, um, yes, I agree with you that uh, the limitations of the study and uh, the situation that uh, ECHO have been derived on. But could I comment on this uh, hypokinesia that, or, or this global uh, dysfunction that has been worse than before? Could it be related to myocarditis affecting uh, as a new pathophysiology affecting uh, the patient, uh, leading and, and even the, um, uh, causing even further decrease of, uh, of the flow across the valve, so the, the aortic valve, so could be new, uh, new pathology? To worsening of his uh, cardiac function. Professor Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in, in defense of the BSE, can I just say um, that um, the guidelines were picked up or, or, or developed in the context of the COVID to try and answer 
the commonly asked questions in people who are not known to necessarily have cardiac disease and they come in with symptoms that might suggest an acute cardiac event, i.e., you know, does somebody have left ventricular dysfunction? Um, is there a big vegetation sitting that is obvious? Or does somebody have pericardial effusion? Those are the kind of some or right heart dilatation in acute breathless people with the suspected people. That, that is the simplistic approach to why these guidelines were developed. The, the echocardiogram as a tool is far more complex and tremendously valuable in a lot of patients. And I think we just need to be careful not to allow the probability possibility of getting an infection override the value of a test when it is actually clinically necessary and, and would help in treatment. Uh, I go, about, go back to what I had said earlier on, which is, I think an echo, I, I, I agree with poor rate control, it doesn't make sense to look for left ventricular function. The couple of questions that you would want is, you know, in, in a situation like this is, where is the fever coming from in a vulnerable patient? Have they got endocarditis, is there a big vegetation? Have they got an effusion? What does the valve look like, if at all possible to judge? Although the pre-test probability, as Sid Said was referring to, in somebody who has got a body mass index which is high and a weight of 120 kilograms and a heart rate of 150, that going to give you accurate information is small, but it gives you a feel for what the valve looks like. And I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably pleased with the comment that you know the, the, the aortic stenosis looks slightly worse than what it was before, but clearly the valve on visual assessment is not moving. Thankfully, there's no big vegetation. Um, the ventricular assessment, in my opinion, I think we knew clinically the guy was in heart failure. So if there are regional wall motion abnormalities, he's, he's in atrial fibrillation, he's got a bundle branch block. Are we surprised that, the, you know, that you're seeing it? probably not. I think the value was excluding effusion, look at the valve and get a feel for what the valve looks like. If the valve is worse than compared to before, or there is a clinical big thing sitting on the valve, then you've got your diagnosis. At this point in time, I think this guy's got a combination of degenerative aortic valve disease with an arrhythmia in the context of an infective illness. We're still not sure whether we understand what that infective illness is. Thanks very much. So, Dr. Hind, if you can carry on, please. This patient had a, a blood culture which showed a new growth. Uh, you know, um, I consider with a blood culture, uh, which was negative. Uh, he did not have a tetronic or a broken uh, uh, patient. So, uh, and I think the, uh, the microditis was not considered in this patient and uh, there was no troponin actually requested for him. Uh, this is just a slide uh, about, you know, the clinical course of uh, this patient during admission. And if you can move on to the next slide, so I think that shows a nice summary of, of what the management was for this patient. So if you go to the okay. next slide, that's, yes. Yeah, so. Right, so this table shows um, uh, how this patient was managed from the heart failure point of view. Uh, starting from um, day one uh, when his heart failure was treated. Uh, so on admission, uh, as we know that he had a, uh, he was on 40 milligram of oral frusamide and started uh, the day uh, on admission on 80 milligram uh, uh, IV frusamide and that was continued for two days uh, and his initial uh, uh, weight was uh, 123.5 with a creatinine of 115. Uh, after two days, he was switched to oral, uh, and due to his uh, creatinine, which started to uh, increase uh, by day three, it was about 127, he was put on 120 milligram of uh, furosemide orally. Uh, his weight was not actually. Uh, um, responding very well. His, uh, on the third day, his weight was 123.2. Uh, he continued on 120 milligram of oral furosemide uh, till the, um, for about two days, actually. Uh, on the fourth day, as we can see, his weight uh, reduced to 122.5. So he started to lose weight and his creatinine has improved. 
So even below the baseline, actually. And he continued on that, on that dose uh, until uh, on day four, actually, he was started on candesartan. So the candesartan was started on day four uh, uh, after admission, and he was his amlodipine was stopped. Then uh, he continued uh, for a couple of days on this dose until day six, and he was still losing weight, actually. His creatinine was still improving. Then he had a, uh, a single dose of metalazone. And he's, uh, by that time, actually, I think in day five, uh, his uh, furosemide was increased to uh, 12080. And on day six, uh, he was uh, given single dose of metalazone. Uh, on the base of uh, that he was uh, slowly responding, still having much feet and uh, leg edema, though he was losing weight and uh, his urine output was um, good. Uh, the next day, uh, his uh, first amount was increased on, to 120 milligram twice a day. Uh, his weight was 119 with a creatinine of uh, 136. I think it was started uh, uh, the same day when his kidney function showed this reading of creatinine. Then the next day, on day eight, actually, his uh, creatinine started to creep uh, up to 150, and his weight was still uh, responding very well, actually. and. The uh, furosemide at that stage uh, considered to, sorry, uh, I just go to the previous one. Uh, I just forgot to mention on day seven, his spironolactone was started. Uh, it was started on 25 milligram of spironolactone. And the next day, uh, we could see that his creatinine went up to 150. Uh, but his weight was uh, responding very well. As we can see, so the event that happened uh, prior to this creatinine, uh, the, prior to the uh, rising creatinine, starting the spironolactone, uh, he was given a single dose of metalazone, and his candesartan was started actually like three days prior to that. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Hind, if you just go back, if you just go back a second, um, so I'd just like to, to, you know, to invite anybody to, to comment on this sort of management regime. I think we forgot to mention that the patient was, was, was uh, started on bisoprolol and, and was quickly up titrated uh, to 10 milligrams within the first two days. Um, that's the only thing we forgot to mention. But in terms of diuretics, IV versus oral, and, 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 and responses in terms of the renal, uh, according to the renal profile and the creatinine. Yeah, can I, can I comment on that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, thanks Hilde again for this nice case. Uh, so uh, obviously the patient uh, presented and admitted to the field to compensate heart failure. Obviously he was on 40 milligram or uh, prosamide. Then obviously you need to shift to IV prosamide as uh, uh, done actually by treating the patient actually. Coming to the renal function in the setting of acute heart failure, then we need to remember uh, two different uh, main pathophysiological mechanisms of acute kidney injury in heart failure. That is, you have uh, renal hypoperfusion, which is mainly related to arterial side of the circulation. And on the other side, we have renal venous hyperbolemia and hypertension due to volume overload. So obviously, we need to be very critical in assessing this. You need to understand which was a, is the cause of acute kidney injury in setting of heart failure. I agree in cleansing of that is that is difficult, but that's quite important. Because if the acute kidney injury and deterioration in renal function due to uh, hypervolemia uh, as a, a result of renal venous hypertension, as in this case, then you need to push more diuretics, even though you are going to see some more deterioration in renal function, but you need to be reassured that it's at the end is going to be okay, and this is what exactly happened in this, uh, in this case. So, obviously, I will go with IV uh, prosamide for a couple of uh, 48 to 72 hours 
I would in line if the renal function deteriorates a little bit because I will know this is going to be normalized uh, days later. Uh, introducing spironolactone earlier on, yeah, is a little bit, uh, maybe I am worried about that because I know, we you know this patient is just recovering from a quick kidney injury. So I will wait uh, till discharge and see patient again and start it on uh, MRA uh, in this type of patient. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. Uh, yes, and could I comment? Yes, okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, I agree that the patient is uh, shifting from uh, uh, cardiorenal syndrome type 2 to, to type 1 or um, uh, to some worse of his function. I agree with the policy of uh, the dehydrating of the patient, but I will not, I will not uh, rush to metalazone, uh, spironolactone, and atacan, three of them with the diuresis, because all of them. Uh, in, in a way or another, I'll be deleterious to the kidney. Once I am dehydrating the patient and overloading the patient, I will just stick to this one, and I will just uh, leave the prognostic medications like atacad or uh, or um, spironolactone a bit later, so as not to push more harm on the kidney. I'll, I'll be just more gentle in dealing up with the patient. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. thank you. Abu Saroud. Uh, yes, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, actually, I want to add something to what Dr. Musa said uh, and Dr. Nasreen. As, as you know, one of the lessons that we learned from those trials, those trials looked at the policies of tolozomide or diuretics versus infusion. It was negative trial. Mm. Uh, but, but one of the lessons we learned was that if you give policies of tolozomide, kidney function will mildly impair uh, in the first uh, uh, few days. Then it improves before going home, before discharge. So I, I agree with Dr. Mosa that based on this uh, trial, I would say I, I won't be very worried about uh, some slight deterioration of the kidney function in the very early beginning of IV diuretic treatment. And I would rather, and, 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 and that reflects the high renal venous pressure, which is the same like high GVP um, and high wedge pressure. So it's, it's kind of, of, um, of a marker of high feeling pressure. So I, I, I would rather carry on with IV furosemide for a few days. Uh, but on the other hand, if, if kidney function is not, is not significantly deteriorating, I would uh, start giving some spironolactone or aldosterone antagonist before discharge uh, because kidney is not, it's not significantly impaired and it, it's, it's not acute kidney injury by definition. Um, one more thing is that this will preserve the potassium um, in, in, in such hypokalemic patient. Thanks very much. And Professor Janejo, please. Uh, you're on mute at the moment. So if you can unmute your microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, yeah. Sorry, I would like to second what has just been said, which is, uh, so there is data from the emphasis and the emphasis studies um, or, of uh, using <laughs> epilaronone and also from spironolactone, the RALS study. RALS was in stable patient, the emphasis was in unstable patients. But there is safety. We know that the signals of renal functions are just those. They're signals of what the physiology is doing in response to treatment being given. Um, this gentleman is not at a level where we would be terribly worried about the renal deterioration unless it was sustained. I would leave the expert comments to Saeed to, 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 if, he's, if he's listening yes. uh, to clarify. But as far as I'm concerned, we would also be aiming to get, I have to say my threshold for using metolazone is probably higher than it is for spironolactone and epilenone. I use metolazone in resistant cases when I've tried all the other bits because we know that metolazone hits the kid much harder. In all of the three, so combination of candesartan, metolazone, spironolactone, I think it was metolazone that probably hit the renal function harder in this individual. I think if we had been upfront with candesartan and spironolactone, probably the renal function may not have been as um, impacted as it has in this situation. Thank you very much. Dr. Saeed, if you'd like to come Yeah, in. thank you, uh, Dr. Genejo. Um, what was your output in this gentleman? Did you record that somewhere? <laughs> Was that recorded in his uh, daily charts or not? And then the second question is, why was the, what was the indication for the metolazone? His weight was coming down. Uh, I agree. Uh, it's a question for me. Yes. Generally, yes. in management, whoever yeah. 
You would yeah, have he, he, he was actually responding and it was slowly, it was considered like a slow um, response. And uh, that was a decision to give him like it's just a single dose of mitolazone at that stage. Uh, and, uh, you know, I obviously I agree that uh, contributed to his uh, worsening kidney function. Uh, the spironolactone was started uh, about four days prior to discharge, actually. Um, and all these events, the spironolactone and the, this dose of mitolazone, as you can see, and prior to that, candesartan probably contributed to uh, the uh, acute worsening or acute uh, yeah. was uh, there kidney one injury. Team looking after this patient, or, uh, and they had continuity of care. Was there one team and one consultant? Or was it different people looking after them? Because that's what happens when different people look after them. Everybody comes and makes a little bit of change and then disappears. Yeah, there's some change in the, you know, the, 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 the caring team, actually. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. You, you, you like two, two. Yeah, exactly. Two, you notice that from the medication, the way it's prescribed, somebody's got a logical idea of what they want to do and then they leave and then somebody else comes and they add a little bit more. Because as physicians, we always want to do something rather than wait for it to have an effect. Because we're in that time pressure situation. Thank you very much, Dr. Said. That's a really uh, very, very good point. Um, so, Dr. Hind, if you could just uh, complete, finish off your presentation. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah, as we can see here, well, after this deterioration, his frosamide was reduced from 120 BD to uh, 80. If you can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And but he continued to lose uh, weight. I'm just gonna, uh, I'm going back to just to mention about the rate control. This is his heart failure point of view. Uh, the rate control uh, um, aspect, he was uh, started on Visipril, which was up titrated up to 10 milligram uh, uh, on the third day of admission. And he also was started on digoxin uh, uh, because his rate was not well controlled on 10 milligram bisoprolol, and uh, that digoxin was actually increased to uh, 180, um, 7.5 microgram. So this is from the heart, uh, uh, from the atrial fibrillation point of view on heart rate control. Um, uh, X-ray was uh, repeated, uh, and I just put the admission X-ray just to compare. I don't know if you can see it very well. And you see the um, uh, repeated X-ray, and as we can see, it's much uh, there's much improvement uh, with regard to the pulmonary congestion. So obviously, uh, the uh, he responded uh, very well to diuresis. On the on day 11, this patient was ready uh, uh, for discharge. Uh, he remained stable. He felt much better. Uh, his leg edema uh, was uh, improving. Uh, it was uh, almost in discharge. On discharge, he was uh, he was having very minimal uh, leg edema. His urine output remained very uh, good uh, throughout the admission. His uh, atrial fibrillation was controlled, and uh, as we can see, that he lost about eight kg since uh, admission. His creatinine uh, was improving. Um, it was on, on discharge. It was one twenty five, and uh, the plan. Uh, uh, for him was to be uh, followed in the heart uh, failure specialist nurse uh, clinic in about uh, three weeks. Uh, those are his medication on discharge. As you can see, bisoprolol, uh, 10 milligram, he was still on the two milligram of candesartan. Digoxin was increased to 187.5, uh, as I mentioned. And his furosemide on the day of discharge was reduced further to 80 milligram uh, once a day. He was kept on a spiral electron and of course uh, on his uh, um, anticoagulant. So three weeks uh, post, uh, actually three weeks uh, review uh, happened with the heart failure specialist nurse uh, and uh, during the visit uh, he was uh, actually uh, found to be stable in New York, New York Heart Association um, class two uh, he reported dizziness, mainly on standing and moving head. Uh, he was in, still in atrial fibrillation with a controlled rate. Uh, he was hemodynamic and stable. His blood pressure was fine, though the patient showed uh, uh, um, his diary uh, of blood pressure at home, which showed a systolic blood pressure of around 100. 
and no change was uh, done at that stage due to dizziness. Uh, the plan was to uptitrate his candesatan, but that's, that would, did not happen. And a plan for a repeat transthoracic echo in six weeks. And he was advised to continue uh, weight uh, monitoring and uh, blood pressure monitoring at home. Uh, I couldn't find any mention about uh, the weight uh, in the clinic visit, but this is probably uh, due to either stable weight or uh, no change in his weight. And uh, I think by that I will you know, I'll come to the end of this um, um, case. Uh, there are just a few uh, points for discussion. Uh, which uh, you know, I thought uh, about what was the cause of decompensa decompensation of this patient. Uh, the discharge in the discharge summary, the diagnosis was just decompensated heart failure. But um, you know, if we think, and I think this was discussed earlier, is it tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy? Is it the infection? Uh, is it uh, due to his uh, tissue uh, aortic valve stenosis and whether this needs further assessment? Uh, coronary artery disease possibility, but unlikely uh, given that he had no, no history of chest pain. There's a comment of no regional wall motion abnormality, but I think the echo is not really informative. It might maybe need a, a contrast echo to further uh, assess uh, his um, or his LV function. Uh, he also had, uh, two years ago, he had a CT uh, aortic root and uh, there was no comment about significant coronary artery disease. Uh, the other point uh, about the fluid restriction and how to balance the um, and reserve the renal function, we talked about that. I think um, it was, uh, in this case, the, uh, you know, the maybe early uh, medication, addition of some medication contributed to that. But uh, it's a, you know the point of fluid restriction because um, I think there is uh, some controversy and some opinion about uh, treating those patients or considering restriction of fluids on patients in patients with heart failure. So uh, I think this is the last slide for this um, case. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hind. Um, does anybody have any comments? Thank you, uh, Ahmed. Uh, can I just? Uh... Thank you very much, Dr. Hinge, for bringing this uh, practical approach to how to apply knowledge in this kind of uh, very challenging case. And I got just a few questions from the audience. I think we're going to start with Dr. Gineja, just a very quick comment on this case, basically. Why we don't use uh, butane infusion early in this case? And the second question, what about the DC cardiovascular in this kind of uh, patient? He came with heart failure, and clearly he's in... AF with rapid ventricular response. And the third thing is also, is there any role in hydroxychloroquine in this kind of patient? Dr. Ginejo, can you hear me? Can I, can, can, is this for me, yes? Yes. Okay, so uh, I think, yeah, exactly, I echo the word. Uh, I think it's a, it's a fantastic case to bring in and, and raises a, a number of practical issues that we need to uh, address. So first things first, uh, we, are not clear why this person deteriorated. We have presumed that the temperature perhaps was suggestive of some kind of infection, although the CRP was fine. And we empirically treated with antibiotics. I'm not entirely sure that you know we are we can reliably say there was an infection somewhere. The chest X-ray was abnormal, but not abnormal enough with focal consolidation. The difference between the two chest X-rays could easily be explained, in my opinion, and this is my personal opinion, on exposure alone. is a, a big individual with a rotated, very underexposed chest X-ray, and then the second X-ray is better positioned and more penetrated, and you can see the difference. So um, I, I reserve my judgment on the infective side of things. He was clearly more abnormal than, oh, sorry, was different from the first one and was more abnormal. The axis deviation was present on the first one. There was left axis with narrow QRS complex. The second axis, the second ECG showed broader QRS complex with almost a um, incomplete left bundle branch block presentation. So whether that was conductive tissue abnormality as a response to cardiac decompensation, myocardial stress, or whether there was an ischemic element, we will never know. He didn't have chest pain, he didn't have troponin, um, and uh, therefore we are not sure whether this was purely a physiological stress or whether there was an ischemic element to it. It is unclear why we didn't do a repeat ECG and whether that uh, changed wrong course of admission or not. 
and it is unclear why we didn't do an echo prior to discharge when his heart rate is 81 in atrial fibrillation. So I stand by my original um, uh, sort of comments when we were initially discussing this case, which is, um, to me, if I assume that there is no ischemic element and the temperature is probably just a red heading, then the only obvious identifiable cause of cardiac decompensation is a new atrial fibrillation. And that is in the context of uh, probably a degenerative tissue aortic valve. Now, I understand that it is difficult to be confident about the gradients and so on and so forth in rapid ventricular response uh, atrial fibrillation, but we could have perhaps had a better idea if we repeated an echo prior to discharge. But my, my original plan stands, um, control the rhythm as quickly as you can or offload them, stabilize them, control the rhythm as quickly as you can. If you can do that, you're better off. As you see in this individual who was seen three weeks later, still in atrial fibrillation with some element of postural change, hypotension, but we've not done anything to, to correct the primary um, sort of present, presenting or precipitating factor in my opinion. So I think we've still left him without uh, the def definitive treatment that I think would have made a difference in his symptoms and his outcome. Thanks so much, Professor. Dr. Abu Sarid. Sarid? Yeah. Just to add something to what the Prof. Junija uh, said, is that the main gradient was in 20s. Uh, I mean, through the valve. It was in 20s when ejection fraction was 45. And during this admission, the gradient is in high 30s uh, when LV is severely impaired. So I think there is something significant going on with this um, aortic uh, prosthetic valve function, and that needs to be reassessed. No. I think absolutely, absolutely agree, but we need to reassess it in sinus rhythm because the first ones were done in sinus rhythm. So if we want to bring him back to sinus rhythm and then reassess the valve to see whether the eight or 10 years down the road of the valve implant, there is need for us to do different. Absolutely. I, I, I you know, a very astute observation. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, uh, I've got to comment. That. Yes, Dr. Batri. Right. I, I, I mean, what we would like to do for TOE, trans or subgel cardiac test is aortic valve pain. Because of the patient habit, the trans was not taken in way. We would like to test it aortic valve to know whether it has got work. We know that, I mean, whether a recent onset or, uh, or, or a new onset due to his heart failure, but what the assessment of the aortic valve is needed. Another question about the uh, question of the in, in this case, when we are going to, to, to introduce it in, in, in this case. Okay, does anybody want to take that question on? So just before, before the pandemic, I think the next step would have been UE. But during the pandemic and the risk of uh, aerosol producing procedure, that should be planned very cautiously and uh, uh, one more, th one more thing. I think uh, Dr. Badri was, because there was some people on the line, I think he did mention uh, Saku Peter Vazartan, didn't he? Yes, yeah. So, so um, uh, Dr. Hind, she did mention that the patient has dizziness in, uh, on, on two milligram of candy sartan. Uh, so I think introducing uh, the Saku Peter Vazartan at this point might be challenging as well. Thank you. And, and, and I agree in the context of uh, outflow tract obstruction, although moderate, I mean, we could have a low flow, high gradient aortic stenosis in the context of poor ventricle and uh, relatively low gradient. And in this context, secretory valve santon has not been tried and tested and is not evidence based. So uh, while it is a very valuable drug in appropriate selected patients, in this context, I would hold back. And that's also coming back to um, what Mohammed said just there in terms of TOE, uh, if the individual has clinically stabilized and their rate is controlled and they're clinically better, we would aim to, if you wanted to do a TOE, you could repeat the COVID uh, swab and if the COVID swab is negative, you could still then go with a relatively, relatively, I say that, relatively lower risk TOE um, rather than going blind upfront on day one when you didn't know the result. Theoretically, these things are possible. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Janejo.
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hind Zain, for your case presentation and your, your efforts. And thank you, Professor Janejo, for your, your talk. Do thank Dr. You. Saeed, thank you very much as well. Thank you to all our panel members. Um, and thank you for everyone who's listening. I'd like to end the session now. I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Abdul Azim Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed, and many thanks to uh, everyone joining us this uh, morning and this afternoon for this very fantastic talk today. Many thanks, Dr. Saeed and Dr. Jineju and Dr. Hing for, and Dr. Yaqub and Dr. Nasreen and Dr. Muhammad Abu Saud and Dr. Muhammad Al Badri and Dr. Ahmed Adlana as well for taking your time to joining us and to talk to us and to share your knowledge, your experience with us during very this is a very difficult time. We really appreciate it.